It was June of 1940, and the war in Europe had been running for nine months. Dunkirk had just been evacuated. France was on the verge of surrender. Italy had just joined the Axis, and Norway had just fallen to Nazi Germany. Churchill had just given his famous We shall fight them on the beaches speech. To say the war was going badly for Britain and her Commonwealth allies was an understatement. RAF Bomber Command was one of the few avenues the Allies could go on the front foot with. These aircraft required trained crew, pilots, gunners, observers, navigators, etc. One in three crew of an RAF bomber in World War II was either a Canadian, Australian, New Zealander or a Pole. 1,703 New Zealanders who flew with Bomber Command would lose their lives. Hundreds more injured or captured. The airspeed Oxford was designed and built as a trainer for British Commonwealth Air Forces, later their allies. Nicknamed the Oxbox, the aircraft was built almost entirely out of wood, a construction process not too dissimilar to those of the First World War. Two hundred and ninety-nine airspeed Oxfords were used by the New Zealand Air Force, and I think it's fair to say they didn't have the greatest safety records. Seventy-two were destroyed in accidents, and thirty-six became unairworthy due to structural issues. You don't have to be good at maths to work out that one in three crashed or simply couldn't handle the stresses of flight. The first Oxford arrived in New Zealand in 1938, before World War II, and the last hit the shores of New Zealand in 1952. Nine of those were at Wigram Base in Christchurch, as at June 1940, along with another nine fairly Gordon light bombers. Coincidentally, my father was at Wigram Base, being trained for service in World War II, but the war ended just as he was about to be sent overseas. It was a Saturday morning at 8.50 when the Oxford took off from Wigram Air Station and headed out over Taitapu towards Banks Peninsula. Today's mission was designed to improve air-to-ground shooting. On board was a two-man crew. The pilot of the day, Francis McFarlane, aged 24, who preferred to go by the name Peter. Gunner that day, John McFadden, 22, who everyone called Tim. Both were experienced qualified pilots not far away from being dispatched to the action in the Northern Hemisphere. The flying conditions were perfect and after completing their practice around Lake Ellesmere, they flew off towards the town of Akaroa. The bomber appeared from the south flying up Akaroa Harbour from the heads. Compared to other planes who trained in the area, it appeared to be flying unusually low. The aircraft passed over the golf links and then turned left down Grehan Valley, and now appeared not just to be losing altitude, but also airspeed. Turning left again and flying straight over the town, the aircraft lost speed and suddenly plunged 500 feet in a spinning dive into the village. Crashing into the corner of Kwa and Lavu streets. Mm. 
Mr. Brown ran the tobacconist and barber shop, which was doing a good trade that Saturday morning. On the other side of the street was Mr. Stewart's pharmacy. This was what Mr. Brown had to say at the inquest. I was shaving a man at the time when I heard a plane overhead, and it sounded very, very low. The next thing I knew it had crashed right into the shop, and the whole shot went up in flames. It seemed that a wing hit the aid wall of the shop in Cross Street, and then the petrol tanks apparently burst. The wing came through the wall and smashed everything to smithereens. There were six men in the shop, but they were all lucky, no one suffering any injury apart from the fright of their life. The man in the chair was like the rest of us. Out of the shop in a flash, with one side of his face shaved and the other still covered in lather. As far as myself, I went so fast out of the place that the razor was still in my hand when I got home. So how many died? Incredibly, just the two crew perished. Two young girls out the back of Brown's received minor burns. That was it. The plane had struck a chimney of the draper shop before Brown's and Stewart's and broken up upon impact. I had mentioned its rather flimsy construction process earlier. An inferno quickly engulfed the corner of the main street fuelled by aviation gas. Wreckage was scattered everywhere, enveloping the whole town with smoke. One of the engines fell within 10 feet of two people, and within 20 feet of a lady holding up her son to see the plane. Stuart's chemist shop was set alight. Stuart, who saw what was about to happen, had the presence of mind to race out the back of his shop and flatten his wife and child standing in the backyard to shield them from the impending crash. It was a sheer miracle people on the ground on that busy Akaroa weekend morning weren't killed or at least seriously injured. An inquiry was held. However, accidents in airspeed Oxfords were a regular thing. And just six days after Akaroa, one burst into flames on the Tyree runway, killing one. Three weeks after Akaroa, a crash killed four when the plane from Wigram crashed into a hill near Lake Ellesmere. In August, another death occurred in a nighttime operation close to Blenheim. By far the saddest outcome, however, was that of the McFarlane family. They had four sons. All four lost their lives in World War II. Lest we forget. <laughs>